Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Pat Parkinson. Pat is a senior fellow at the Bank Policy Institute and a 30-year one veteran of the Federal Reserve System, where he was director of the Division of Banking Supervision and Regulation. During that time, he was also a member of the Basel Committee on Banking and advised Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, and Tim Geithner on financial market issues. Pat joins us today to discuss the Treasury market meltdown in March 2020 and what can be done moving forward to avoid this challenge from happening again. Pat, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to have you on. Now, you have a great paper you've co-written with Nelly Liang at Brookings, and I'm excited to get into it. But before we do, I'd love to hear about your career. You've had quite the run there at the Federal Reserve System, worked with some prominent leaders of the Federal Reserve. So maybe share with us how you got into it and then some of your maybe highlights from that time there. Sure. Well, I joined the Fed way back in 1980 during the Volcker era, I think, uh, and started out actually in the international division. I think a turning point for me really was uh, in early 1988, I was named chief of the capital markets section in the research division. And around that time, we were still working to sort through the implications, policy implications of the 1987 stock market crash. And that got me involved number one, substantively in issues around the capital markets, uh, mainly regulatory issues. And then also, because a lot of that work was conducted by the president's working group on financial markets, which was comprised of the chairman of the Fed, the secretary of the treasury, and the chairman of the CFTC and SEC, I got involved in that set of issues. And in fact, was sort of the principal staff person supporting the chairman's participation, first chairman Greenspan, and then Chairman Bernanke from, say, 1990 all the way to 2008. And so during that period, I dealt with a bunch of, I didn't, other than early my career, have much to do at all with monetary policy. I had episodic involvement in banking regulation, but had a lot of involvement in other issues. Like, for example, I think I was the board's derivatives expert for many, many years, and also spent a lot of time on clearing and settlement of securities and derivatives, where I, I think, led the work of the G10 Committee on Payment and Settlement Systems for quite a few years, and in fact, was the co-chair of the first central bank securities regulator task force that developed the standards for security settlement systems and derivatives clearing houses. And that was something I did through much of my career. I should bring Tim Geithner into the story, I guess. Uh, I think I knew him a little bit when he was at Treasury back in the Rubin Treasury days. But he became president of the New York Fed, I'm guessing, around 2003. That might not be exactly right. And one of the issues he really decided to tackle was OTC derivatives. And I was very glad about that because I was one of a small number of staff members who were pushing for a long time to strengthen the clearing and settlement infrastructure for the OTC derivatives market, but without much success. And I think the key thing that was lacking was uh, some powerful figure to put the full energies and force of the Federal Reserve behind that, and Tim provided that. So I worked with him very closely in, in those years, say 2003 to 2007. Then along comes the financial crisis, and again, I interacted with him a good bit on that, I think probably my most important involvement was in developing some of the emergency liquidity facilities uh, at that time. And the New York Fed and Tim really played a, a leading role in all that. I think in some sense, the uh, board staff and even the governors were in a supporting role. I think one of the best things that best judgments that Ben Bernanke showed was to say, gee, Tim really is good at this stuff. And the New York Fed have last, lots of expertise Uh, I'm going to let them take the lead and be supportive on these things and not let egos and org charts get in the way. And that really led to then knowing Tim from both uh, the derivatives wars and uh, and the financial crisis. When he became Secretary of the Treasury in 2009, he asked me to come join him 
to work on regulatory reform. And I only lasted about six months. I must say the Treasury Department and the political aspects uh, were not uh, to, my, to my liking, but we did get out this white paper on, on what should be the policy response to the great financial crisis, global financial crisis, and uh, finished the white paper, which in some sense was the first draft, although high-level crude draft of, of what became the Dodd-Frank legislation. And then when I came back, I was prevailed upon by Bernanke and Dan Trullo to take on leading the Division of Banking Supervision and Regulation. And that, in some sense, I, I say that was as punishment for my sins because it was for the first time in my, I'd been a deputy director of research, I was a manager of this and that, but I never had to spend a whole lot of my time on management. And as director of the Division of Banking Supervision and Regulation, I had to spend a lot of time on management and uh, can't say that was to my liking, but I've managed to tough it off for two years. And that sort of led to me ending up at Promontory as a banking consultant, which I think in some sense I was miscast as I constantly had to tell them, you know, I was director of banking supervision regulation, uh, but I dealt with a, a number of what I considered the most important targeted issues in supervision and regulation and when, for example, you wanted me to go on a pitch for an engagement on anti-money laundering, the truth of the matter is I knew not one thing about anti-money laundering. <laughs> very interesting. So you got a very storied career there, 31 years, worked with Greenspan, Bernanke, Geithner. And it was interesting, you mentioned Geithner took the lead on the 13-3 facilities back in 2008. Is that what I heard you say? So That's my perception. I'm sure others would tell it differently, but... I think uh, the New York Fed really did play a lead role on most of that. For better or for worse, the, the so-called, so-called maiden lane vehicles, the use of the 13-3 authority to, uh, to facilitate the orderly resolution of Bear Stearns and uh, AIG. Yeah. So maybe uh, we can look at the facilities they did this time around last year as kind of his legacy. His legacy is, you know, these creative uses of 13.3, the different you know, facilities for primary dealers, money market funds, all those facilities that we used. Of course, we're, there were some additional new ones we did this past year, but I hadn't thought about Geithner, one of his legacies being the 13.3 facilities that we now tend to employ whenever there's this crisis. Well, let's move to your paper. It's a really great read. It's with Nelly Liang, as I mentioned earlier, and the title is Enhancing Liquidity of the U.S. Treasury Market Under Stress. So back in March 2020, the Treasury market really was breaking down. It was dysfunctional. And, and maybe walk us through what actually happened and what was going on. Why did the market have this problem? And, and then we'll get into you know, the proposed solutions that you've outlined in the paper. Sure. Uh, I mean, fundamentally, I think it was a matter of supply and demand. There were just extraordinary, unprecedented demands turned treasuries into cash, and they came from many quarters. Uh, I think many people point to hedge funds, the unwinding of, of cash futures, arbitrage trades where they had long positions in cash securities and basically were forced by increasing margin requirements and probably increased perceptions of the risk of that trade to liquidate large amounts of treasuries. You had mutual funds, bond funds in particular, that held treasuries for liquidity, and they mainly hold corporate bonds, but corporate bonds aren't terribly liquid. So when you need liquidity, what do you do? You sell the liquid assets that you have, and those are treasuries. And I think some are tempted to say this was all a problem with the non-bank financial institution sector or the shadow banking sector. And certainly there are were problems there, and there are issues to be addressed. In fact, Nelly and I didn't focus those on those on our paper, but I believe we noted that was not because we didn't think that limiting potential demands from that quarter was an important policy issue. It was simply that was getting so much attention elsewhere that we instead focused our attention on the supply side. And there, I think clearly, you know, those remain over-the-counter markets by and large. And they're not traded on exchanges, they're traded over-the-counter, they're dealer markets. You have a relatively small number of large dealers that are the primary sources of liquidity in the market. And for different reasons, they simply, while they did provide a good bit of the liquidity, they were overwhelmed. They just didn't have the capacity to meet all those demands. And I think there, there's an ongoing debate that uh, probably will never be fully resolved. How much of that was regulation constraining dealers from meeting demand? versus simply dealers having a limited risk appetite. Well, I think undoubtedly 
there is some of both. I think it's crazy to think, given the scale of the sales, that the the you know seven to ten large primary dealers were going to buy all of those treasury securities. But I think nonetheless there were aspects of the post GFC regulatory regime that further limited their capacity to do so. As people say, it limited the availability of balance sheet. We could have a long discussion of which regs and, and, and what role did they play. I think the one that everybody points to is the so-called supplemental leverage ratio. Leverage ratios were put in place. Uh, actually, we always had a leverage ratio in the United States, but additional leverage ratios were put in place after the GFC but they were intended to be a backstop to the risk-based ratios. It was not intended that those, in most cases, be the binding constraint on, and, and therefore the key influence on the way banks allocated their resources. But unfortunately, uh, and there was an interesting debate back in 2014 before the board finalized the supplemental leverage ratio, they debated whether to include reserve balances at the Fed and the denominator of that ratio. And I think in the end, they decided to do so, but that was based on a view that while that might at that time be constraining the ability of banks and making the leverage relationship being close to be binding, that as the Fed normalized its balance sheet, as it sold securities, it had bought as part of QE, the constraint would no longer be binding, so we shouldn't worry about the fact that reserve balance was They were going to be coming down, not to worry. Well, of course, just the, as I say, it was a reasonable response at the time by the staff, but unfortunately, uh, it didn't work out that way. And indeed, I think the perverse thing about the leverage ratios is that when you include reserves and also treasuries, I think, in the denominator of the leverage ratio, it's going to tend to become binding at the worst possible time during the crisis when the central banks, not just the Fed, but other central banks respond the chaos in markets by flooding the, the system with reserves. Governments, at least in this instance, and also in 2008, are borrowing a lot of money, and, and some of those treasuries are ending up on the balance sheets of the banks. So that makes a constraint that used to be in the background now become the banking constraint. And the reason that's important is that the leverage ratio sort of punishes low-risk, low-return activities. It treats all bank activities as if they're equally risky. So that means that they have a disincentive to engage in those low-risk activities like providing treasury repo financing or market making in the treasury markets. And obviously, that's not something you want them to be pulling back from in the midst of a market crisis. Well, that was a question I had after reading your article. And, and I, I've seen some other pieces on the supplemental leverage ratio. But the question I had is, why did they propose this in the first place in, in terms of the reserves being a part of the, you know, the denominator, the assets you include, given that they're so safe. And you just answered my question. It was written in a time where the expectation was the Fed would shrink its balance sheet and reserves would not be a problem. And so it seems striking to me that once the Fed officially adopted this floor operating system or the ample reserve system, they should have gone back and revisited this rule because with the you know, ample reserve system, this will always be an issue, like you said, during a crisis. Yeah, I think the further things are there was a, like in the Basel Committee, they said it was important that the leverage ratio be a simple ratio. And if you started removing some assets from the denominator, that would be a slippery slope. Then inevitably, if you told the banks they could remove the reserves, well, they probably next want to remove treasuries. And then they have lots of other ideas about things. Right, right. And then you get back to the original problem you had. And that's that's fair enough. And also, I think between the agencies, the leverage ratio has almost always been something, you know, in politics, you talk about wedge issues. Well, the leverage ratio is a wedge issue. The FDIC, not only Sheila Bear, but lots of people at the FDIC think that the leverage ratio was the single most important banking regulatory reform post-crisis. I don't think you'll find anybody at the Fed that believes that. They wouldn't have it anywhere near the top of their list of important changes. But it's it's sort of an interagency political issue for that reason. And then now, uh, for reasons uh, I don't fully understand, the progressives regard an erosion of the leverage ratio as, uh, as the worst possible thing that could be done. I don't agree with that, but I think anybody making policy has to take that perspective into consideration. 
Yeah, well, let me go back for just a minute and, and just, again, talk about what happened in March. You provided a nice overview of it. But you know, from an outsider's perspective watching this, it seemed surreal. I mean, the U.S. Treasury market, the mothership of financial markets was was imploding, was you know not functioning. Now, I've, I've learned since then, I've seen some of Ken Garbade's work, if I'm saying his name correct, from the New York Fed. He highlights this has happened before. So World War II, the Fed had to step in, the Treasury market almost collapsed 1958, and then there's the Middle East concerns. And in the 1970s, when the U.S. troops were going into Cambodia, there were treasury market problems. So it's not the first time this has happened, but you know, maybe the first time in recent memory, definitely in my lifetime, it's happened. And it just seemed shocking. You know, in February, we, we saw people rush out of equities, corporate bonds into the safe assets. But then comes March 9, they're racing out of treasuries into cash, which is just, it was, again, very jarring, very shocking. And I'm going to read just an excerpt from a Financial Times article, what it was like for treasury market participants during this time. And this is an article by uh, Colby Smith and Robin Wigglesworth, just the enormity of it and what it looked like from their perspective. And so I'm going to read here just a few paragraphs. It starts with, The wild price swings in March meant many investors struggled to offload even modest treasury positions at sensible prices. Suddenly, broker screens were going intermittently blank and showing no pricing information for what is considered the world's risk-free rate. Deidre Dunn, global co-head of rates at Citi, said it was the most dysfunctional treasury market she has seen in her career, surpassing even the global financial crisis of 2008. Layer on top of that the practical complications of many traders working from home and the emotional stress of pandemic and things were getting chaotic. Quote, this is Deidre again, the intensity of everything at that time was remarkable, she says. They go on, it's a pretty interesting article, but it's just striking that you never would have imagined the mothership of financial markets. Now, I want to kind of step back, and I, th- I think it's pretty clear from your paper, but this is a, a plumbing issue, right? This isn't an issue of government solvency. I- I've heard a few people say that, but this is clearly a plumbing issue, and that's what your paper is about, how to fix the plumbing. Yes. I mean, I, this didn't happen because suddenly people thought the United States uh, wouldn't be able to pay back its debts. It's that people were really you know, this dash for cash, as I think uh, Fed Vice Chairman Quarles has called it, was unprecedented in the sense that in previous crises, there would be a flight to quality. And what did that mean? You sold risky assets and you bought treasuries. Well, in this new world, I think at some point, once people became to question their ability to instantaneously turn treasuries into cash, then that accelerated the movement out of, it became a run on treasuries. And uh, that was the problem. And some of this is the point of our paper is that even though people regarded treasuries as the as the most liquid markets in the world, and they probably were, actually the underlying market structure is pretty rickety. Uh, it's still an over-the-counter market dominated by a, a few dealers where clearing, which is central clearing, which is a feature of most other financial markets, sometimes often mandated, Clearing only only a small share of treasury trades are in fact cleared, and the, where they're traded is over over the counter. There there are some inner dealer trading systems and some dealer to client trading systems, but those are not as transparent and don't provide the liquidity that other markets do. You're speaking out of the structural problems. But before we get into that, I want to flesh that out a little bit more. I want to read a quote from your paper that was excellent. Again, for me, the observer on the outside, this was shocking. But you have this quote in this paper. I love it. It's a great line. And you say, although the evaporation of liquidity, especially in U.S. Treasury markets, came as a shock to both market participants and policymakers, in retrospect, it was unsurprising. You've touched on some of them, and we're going to dig a little bit deeper here. But we shouldn't have been surprised if we had really you know, lifted the hood on the engine, really got down and dirty, got some grease on our elbows, and really pulled apart the inner workings of the a treasury market, we would see there are some real structural problems. You have three, I believe, in your paper. Maybe there's more, but I want to start with them. I want to start with the first one. And you just mentioned the expansion of the size of the market, that the growth itself is something that's really accelerated lately and puts a strain on the market. So talk about that. Well, I mean, obviously, the treasury market has been growing enormously, and the outlook is certainly for further enormous growth. You know, one of the things things the two political parties seem to agree on is at least uh, when it comes to uh, issuing debt to fund things they're in favor of, they're not very worried about debt levels. Uh, you know, I, don't, I wish 
I'm uh, conservative in the old sense. I remember the good old days in the 90s when both parties were committed to fiscal discipline and worried about the growth of the debt. Now it doesn't appear that anybody really is worried about that. And they'll only bring it up as a talking point in opposition to stuff the other guys want to do. So the outlook certainly, and you can look at CBO estimates or whatever you want. We've got a lot more treasury debt on the way. And absent some of the reforms I think we discuss in our paper, I don't see any real growth in market making capacity to meet the demands that may arise when the debt markets get that large. So the growth of the debt markets is a problem given the flawed plumbing of the treasury market. So if we fix the plumbing issues, then this is less of an issue. Let me bring up a perspective on that. Yeah, I think it's plumbing and it's the central bank tools issue. Okay, central bank tool issue. Yeah, and, and some of the proposals you have will address this. Let me uh, bring up, I had a previous guest on the show named Caroline Sissoko, and she makes this observation that the money market in the U.S. has evolved dramatically over the past few decades from an unsecured overnight, like the federal funds market, to repo-based. It's largely repo-based financed. And she makes this point that you know, the repo financing includes a lot of long-term treasury securities as collateral. And what happens as a result of this, whenever there's any kind of pressure, like, like what we saw in March... There's a collateral effect that kicks in as well that makes it very, there's a dynamic that makes it unstable. Where with overnight funding markets unsecured through interbank lending, the Fed could easily step in and address that. But now the Fed has to actually respond to pressures in the treasury market as well because the money market itself has changed. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, it really has changed. One of my first things I did at the Fed was writing a, a long paper with a lot of data about the scale of international interbank markets. And this was in 1982 or before even Basel I. And they were truly enormous. You remember the recycling of the petrodollars, just the enormous depth, almost unlimited depth of, of the interbank markets, the LIBOR markets, for example. And you're right, all of that has changed. I think, for one thing, it was the introduction of, of capital requirements, making banks attentive to how much balance sheet they were using. Banks used to intermediate in those interbank markets for tiny spreads, and that was blowing up their balance sheets. And once you had uh, a meaningful uh, capital requirement, I think first the primary capital ratio that was introduced, God only knows, in the early 80s, it began to constrain that. And then, as you noted, also, I think, over time, there was a shift to, to the extent that financial institutions were willing to lend to one another. They were only willing to do so on a collateralized basis. So the importance of the repo and other securities financing markets. And then finally, the fact that you were mentioning the Fed's ability to stabilize the interbank market. Well, the players in the interbank market were banks, and those banks had access to the discount window, although there is this problem with stigma and their willingness to use it. But in the case of, of the repo markets, most of those participants are broker-dealer entities that may have sort of indirect access subject to a bunch of frictions through their affiliated banks, or if they're non-bank affiliated, they have no access whatsoever. I guess the bigger point I think she's making is that the money market itself has fundamentally changed. And the proposals that we, we're going to discuss today, for example, is a fix given that change as opposed to maybe that change itself should be questioned. Like, should we rely as heavily on repos that have longer-term treasury securities whose price can be affected by sudden swings in the market or by interest rate changes that affect the price? And thus they're collateral. Now, I, I know that's a bigger bigger challenge. Well, I, I would say the issue there is, is the way in a repo you try to mitigate the risk of longer term. You can use a wide variety of, of collateral. And the way you address the risk that there might be a collateral shortfall is through haircuts on the collateral. And the risk, the more price volatility there is in the asset, at least in principle, the, the higher the haircut you charge, so the greater protection. Their point is, I think, that when you talk to people who are secured lenders, one of the key things is how liquid the market for those assets are, how quickly you can liquidate them if they were a default by your counterparty. I remember being told years ago, and I think it's right, think about corporate bonds versus equities. Well, equities, there's much greater price volatility than a corporate bond. 
But a lot of people would tell you they much rather take equities than corporate bonds as collateral at the right haircuts because the equity markets are liquid and the corporate bond markets are basically almost by appointment. So I think the question it raises is if we're going to continue to rely so heavily on secured financing transactions, do we need to impose margin requirements on those? It's interesting that as far as I know, I'm not a lawyer, but my recollection is that the Fed's margin authority, which comes from the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, gives it no authority over treasury collateral. I think it has it definitely has obviously has the famous 50% margin authority on equity. It has authority over corporate bonds and other things that it probably hasn't uh, exercised. I think those are left as good faith margins, but it has no authority over treasuries. And I think that's something that probably should be questioned. As I understand it, that was because at the time, the U.S. government, again, was uh, thinking about issuing lots of debt and the idea of applying margins to people that want to want to borrow to, to buy those securities understandably led to concerns that maybe the cost of the debt would be higher. And maybe that was uh, was the right the trade-off to not give the margin authority when our debt was so small. But given the staggering levels it's reached, I think that's another issue that Nellie and I, I think, touched on, but maybe didn't take a position on in the paper. Okay, so just to summarize the structural issues so we can move on to the proposed reforms, one, just the credit is increasingly provided through the bond market and, and the public debt has grown significantly. So we're relying a lot on that form of financing. Also, you mentioned that the capacity for broker dealers to handle this large amount of bond financing is getting smaller. You actually had an interesting statistic that the share of treasury holdings by these broker dealers was 10% of the total in 2008, and it shrunk to 3% by 2019. So, the, so their balance sheet capacity was shrinking in part due to some of these regulations coming out of the great financial crisis. But then the other flip side of that is, is that if the broker dealers aren't holding these share treasuries on their balance sheet, a decreasing share of them, then other entities must be. And you mentioned these other entities are ones that have to often quickly sell the treasuries. So it's it's a double whammy there and sets us up for the very problems we saw in March. And And I guess, you know, the question is, can we expect to see a March again? I mean, the pandemic was kind of a true tell event. Should we have planned for a tell event before we got to this point? Well, I think the the question really is, uh, obviously, that in some sense, what happened in the tail was that the Fed came in and bought a lot of treasury securities. And probably given the magnitude, how far out we were in the tail in March 2020, maybe that's not a troubling thing. I think some people are actually more troubled by the Fed's intervention in September of 2019, where we weren't anywhere near that far in the tail. And, you know, it's an issue where, to say the least, reasonable people differ. But the question is, how much moral hazard do these Fed interventions create? And I think a reasonable position is, number one, if it's done through repos rather than outright purchases of securities, maybe that's not so bad because the price risk stays with the, the party that's holding the security. But once you get into actual purchase of the treasuries, you'd want that to occur only in the uh, in the five sigma event. And it seems like it's happening in the one and a half sigma event. And probably that's not good for systemic risk in the, in the health of the financial system. You'd like to introduce some reforms that would make, would not necessitate such frequent interventions by the Fed, interventions in a form that carries more rather than less adverse consequences. I wonder, too, the not just the size of the intervention that was needed during March, but the, the time. And it was so quick, right? Where you, you think of like the QE programs in the previous time, 2008, 2009, they had time to go out and buy up securities. I mean, 2008 was a little bit different. Markets were crashing then, too. But they had more time to operate. This was such a quick and sudden rush for cash, right? It wasn't like over multiple weeks, months. It, it had to be addressed quickly. And so really the challenge here, if we're going to have a solution that doesn't require the Federal Reserve sitting in, is having a system robust enough to handle the volume so quickly. 
Okay, well, let's let's talk about your solutions and that will get us there because you we've been kind of beating around the bush here. I want to jump into them. So you have four suggestions. First one is a standing repo facility. So tell us about that. Okay, well, a standing repo facility, I think in the paper, we argue in some sense, the discount window was no longer fit for purpose in a financial system. And so much of the credit needs of the economy are being met through the bond markets rather than through bank loans. We want to make sure that the people that are actually making markets and providing liquidity to the treasury market don't have to worry about their funding needs. And the other thing about a standing facility, there are some difficult issues that I won't deny about who gets access to that facility and how to price that facility. But abstracting away from all difficulties, the notion is that it would be almost, it would be an automatic stabilizer. That when, say, repo rates jumped up, that the Fed would stand ready to make repo loans at a spread to what was the normal market rate. And when it got above that threshold, they would just automatically be providing the the funding that was needed and therefore capping what happens to the repo rate. And of course, repo rates and the repo markets are central to the functioning of the treasury markets as oh, If you're a market maker or anybody contemplating purchasing a treasury and doing so on credit, well, you're not going to purchase the security unless you're certain you have access to the credit. And ultimately, the only entity that has unlimited capacity to meet demands for credit is the Fed. So the concern here is it might create moral hazard. But if you look around, like at the ECB, they have a huge counterparty list compared to what the Fed. The Fed has you know a short list of primary dealers. Like the ECB, other central banks, they use standing repo facilities, and they have a large list of, of counterparties. I guess in my mind, and you talked about maybe limiting it to treasury securities or agencies, but why not allow other assets as long as you know it's properly priced and their haircuts included and make it accessible to more counterparties, not just the primary dealers or broker dealer crowd? Right. Well, I think we suggested it be extended to all broker dealers who were able to meet are willing to meet certain prudential standards by the Fed, not just primary dealers. I don't understand why we limit access to things to the primary dealers. You'll have to ask the New York Fed to get an answer to that question. But what you're saying is what I think is probably, it's interesting. We, I think, expected that our proposal to open it up to this wide range of broker dealers subject to Fed supervision, that most of the opposition would be from people screaming, well, that's too much moral hazard. In fact, we're getting much more of the the other point of view that you just expressed. Well, it's treasury collateral. What's the risk to the Fed? That why don't we open it up to everybody and anybody? And I think there, the answer I would give is that if you did that, uh, there'd be a lot more leverage in the financial system. I mean, people would be willing to take treasury cash futures basis rate. If I didn't have to worry about my ability to roll over my repo financing of the cash treasury position, that would be eliminating one important limit on my appetite for taking on that trade. And more generally, I think, you know, these relative value trades in which treasuries are the safe leg and something more risky is the other leg, you'd probably be giving a lot more energy to the so-called carry trade. But a perspective that I've heard since Nelly and I wrote the paper, which I think is one that uh, I want to think a lot more about, maybe a better answer, is that you don't need to impose a full panoply of prudential regulations on folks that have access to standing repo facility. You just have to make sure that when they take those funds and extend credit to others or, or use the credit to take their own positions, that there's not excessive leverage. And the way you limit the excessive leverage would be through a margin regime. So it comes back to the issue we were discussing earlier. If you empower the Fed uh, or the SEC or whomever to limit the amount you could borrow against treasury securities, wouldn't that address your your issues about leverage in the system? Now, again, it'll be a tricky business of figuring out what the right uh, haircuts or what margin requirements would be for treasury securities. But that seems like a small problem in regulatory policy compared to some of the others we're discussing. So, you know, it's po- I'm warming to the idea that it should be broader and that the essential regulatory measure needed to avoid 
the creation of that facility, greatly increasing leverage and systemic risk in the financial system, his authority and, and effective use of that authority to set margins on not only obviously be margins set on the loans that the Fed makes to the entities with that access the facility, but then on the other side, limits on the leverage that those entities apply to their clients. So this seems like a very promising idea, and I know it's been discussed before. We've had David Andalfalto and Jane Eyrig on. Well, David Andalfalto was on, but they, they proposed the Standing Repo facility some time ago. I know the board was discussing it, or the FOMC was discussing it. Do you have any sense of where this idea stands at the Fed or policymakers, any interest or appetite for it? I don't know. I wish I could tell you they're about to embrace it. I still, I think, I sense there still is discomfort. The other thing, most of these, remember, Nelly and I are trying to increase the supply of liquidity to the treasury markets. I think most of the earlier discussions of a standing repo facility, that may have been a secondary aim. I don't know, but the primary aim was to cap the, the repo rate. Yeah, and I think some of the early proposals also were dealing with how to get reserves off bank balance sheets, too, where yours is more the treasury market. And I want to be clear to listeners as you read this paper that this standing repo facility here that Pat's talking about is, is just one of several. And, and you and Nelly want to see all of them together, not any one by themselves, because as you just mentioned, you know, by itself, there might be some moral hazard issues. So you'd want some other, you know, something else to, to address that. All right, so that's our standing repo facility, first one. Let's move on to your second suggestion, and that is expanded central clearing. And you draw on Daryl Duffy's proposal. So walk us through that. Right. Uh, we draw on Daryl's study. Even Daryl just said it should be studied. I don't think he's forward-leaning, any more forward-leaning than we were. Well, maybe first a bit of background information. We have central clearing of treasuries in the United States. We've had it since 1989 through the fixed income Clearing Corporation, which is a sub of the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation, which is basically the primary uh, provider of uh, clearing and settlement facilities to to the equity and bond markets. But actually, today only a very small share of total trades and treasuries are cleared through the financial through FIC, I'll call it the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation. Uh, and in fact, that share has declined in recent years. It was never a huge share because the clearing of trades was always limited to the so-called interdealer market. And back in the day, at least, I think the, the dealer to client market was 50% of the total treasury market, and none of that had been cleared. And I think that's one of the big nuts to, to crack is how to get clearing to the dealer to client market. With regard to interdealer clearing, the amount of clearing as a share of trades greatly declined because the interdealer market, that's now a misnomer. It used to be that the participants on those trading platforms were, were limited to dealers. And the dealers or banks and broker dealers who were members of the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation. And as a matter of practice, if they traded one another, it was, it was submitted to FIC for clearing. But as these so-called principal trading firms came to account for a huge share of the activity in the interdealer markets, they are not FIC members. So their trades are not clear. So you're down to where you'd have to look at one of the papers by the Treasury Market Practices Group. But I think somewhere t- only 10 or 20 percent of total Treasury trades are cleared through that CCP. So would there be opposition to this? I mean, I can imagine maybe someone loses business if if all the clearings done through the FICC. Besides that, what would be the reason not to go down this path? Well, I think there are some, in the case of interdealer, I don't get it. I mean, you could say maybe uh, the principal trading firms won't participate as actively if you required their trades to be cleared, but I'm pretty sure they participate very actively in the equity markets in the derivative markets, exchange traded derivatives markets, and all that's clear. So if CME and OCC and NSCC have figured out how to get them into clearing, uh, I think where there's a will, there's a way. On the dealer to client stuff, which I actually think is the most important area to get into clearing, so that two things. One, if a dealer, uh, say, is providing, he's buying a security from a from an asset manager, and then selling that in the interdealer market today, well, the one trade with the other dealer may get cleared, but the other one doesn't. So there's no netting benefit. It takes up a bunch of his balance sheet. You'd like to get those asset managers and other buy side firms into clearing. There, I think historically, the impediments have been 
Partly the way clearing works in the U.S. and most other parts of the world is that when you participate in a clearing system, at least directly, it comes with responsibilities for loss sharing. It comes with a mutualization of losses and liquidity pressures in which in, in, in the event that another participant in that clearing system fails. And in the case of buy side firms, in some sense, some cases, their regulatory system prohibits them from participating in such loss sharing. And in others, they simply ask themselves, well, do I really want to be on the hook to contribute to, you know, covering the losses from failure of one of these gargantuan dealers who are the major participants? And they say no. So I think you need to figure out a way around that. There is a product that that FIC has developed called sponsored clearing which is playing a pretty big role in the overnight treasury repo market currently. But basically, the uh, you get a member of FIC, usually a custodian bank currently, to sponsor these buy-side firms. What does that mean? Two things. It means that they take on the responsibilities to, if someone else defaults, to contribute to covering losses and liquidity pressures on behalf of that buy-side client. And then secondly, from the point of view of the FIC, if the buy side client or a hedge fund were to default, they provide a guarantee that they'll make up for any losses that FIC might incur as a result of one of these sponsored members failing. And that has been pretty successful in the dealer to client space. I had some concern that it might be concentrating a lot of activity in the in the custodian banks. Uh, But actually just Maybe yesterday or earlier this week, the New York Fed released a paper that said, at least in the case of overnight repo market for treasuries, in fact, uh, sponsored clearing has has decreased concentration. That seems counterintuitive to me, but maybe that's because probably the biggest custodians of our Bank of New York and State Street, and they were they were not among the largest dealers. They weren't. They're not primary dealers. So it may be that their greater share is coming at expense of some even larger participants, and that's why measures of concentration aren't increasing. But I think there are a bunch of issues around uh, client clearing. Is sponsored clearing the path forward? If it isn't, what is? And if it is, how do you address certain concerns about concentration and access, et cetera, et cetera? But again, I think those are questions that, again, if there's a will, there's a way. We can sort through those issues. And I don't have any sympathy for the inner dealer markets. Not I just wouldn't put up with that. So, with the previous proposal, standing repo facility, I think it's pretty clear how that would address the problem. You would, you know, reduce the fear, the desire to liquidate your your treasuries quickly because you know there's a standing repo facility there. It might open up some balance sheet space. How does central clearing address the problems we had in March 2020? I say three things. One, because it does affect netting of purchases and sales. It means that it it takes up little or no balance sheet space for the existing dealers. So it increases their capacity to intermediate. I also think particularly, second thing, if central clearing led the way to -to all-to-all or peer-to-peer trading systems, I think that, number one, smaller dealers would be better able to compete with the larger dealers so it would become less concentrated and they might allocate more capital to supplement the capital they're currently allocating. And indeed, in some sense, you obviate dealer intermediation. If one mutual fund can sell a treasury security to a pension fund with the intermediation being done with FIC and no need for them to be transacting with the dealer, then then obviously that doesn't require any dealer balance. And all the rub would be Uh, Typically, those have to be cleared, and and typically you've got a clearing firm intermediating between them, and it'll take up some of its balance sheet. Okay, so you increase balance sheet capacity in a major way if you have more central clearing. Yes. Okay, and that was a big deal in March 2020. Okay, so we have the standing repo facility. We have increased use of central clearing And your third proposal is some changes to bank holding company regulations. You've touched on them already, but deals, I think, primarily with the supplemental leverage ratio. But you have a few others that you you suggest. But again, walk us through the supplemental leverage ratio and why it can make a big difference in any future crisis like March 2020. Well, I think two things. One, it's intended to be a backstop measure. as I think we discussed this earlier. But what happens in a crisis is the Fed floods the system with reserves. 
the Treasury tends to be issuing a lot of debt, which leads to Treasuries piling up on, on the balance sheets of dealer banks. So for those both those reasons, the denominator of the leverage ratio balloons and the leverage ratio, not the risk-based ratios, become the binding constraint. And because the risk-based ratios trade basically all assets as equally risky, including reserves held at the Fed, that discourages banks from engaging in, in low-risk activities like providing repo financing or acting as a market maker in the treasury markets. So you're discouraging them from doing what you need them to do at the very moment when you most need them to do it. Another way of saying that is the supplemental leverage ratio, when it has reserves included in the denominator, is pro-cyclical. <laughs> It, it's a pro-cyclical regulation during crisis. It makes things worse, which is not the intention. The other point, though, you brought out earlier was just the fact that the rule was designed with the intention of the stock of reserves declining over time. And just you know, since this crisis started, you bring us out in the paper. We started off about one point seven trillion, you know, early last year, and now we're up past three trillion, uh, three point one trillion. Last I checked in reserves. So this is going to be... And wise heads think it's going to north of $5 trillion, I understand. Yeah, so this is going to be not just a cyclical issue, but a, a structural long-term one, something that has to be addressed, I, I imagine. And again, if the context of designing this rule was the vision of, of shrinking the Fed's balance sheet, and now it, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be large and larger, it seems like this rule needs a revisit on a permanent basis, not just the temporary one we've received. Right. Well, they're going to need to revisit because the the temporary exclusion of reserves and treasuries from the denominator of supplemental ratio, brothers ratio at the holding company level, which was done by the Fed, that temporary exclusion expires at the end of March. So they have less than a month to uh, figure this out and probably shouldn't have people on pins and needles as, as the date approaches. So they actually have less time. And, you know, there are various ways you could address this issue. One would be to make uh, particularly the exclusion of reserves permanent. Uh, I think other people think uh, another way would simply to be to recalibrate, particularly the so-called enhanced supplemental leverage ratio to lower the required ratio and, again, make it be unlikely to be a binding constraint even when reserves are growing. In any event, one thing about that, I think you mentioned the pro-cyclical element. One of the remarkable things is that the Bank of England turned out to be prescient in this regard. In that I, don't want, I won't get the timing right, but several years ago, they departed from, from what then was the Basel Agreement and decided to exclude balances held at the Bank of England from the leverage ratio. And to avoid the charge that they were watering down the international standards, they then recalibrated the minimum requirement. Minimum requirement internationally is three be recalibrated, I think it was to three and a quarter. And the logic was if you looked at least at the UK banking system as a whole, reserves included 3%, reserves excluded three and a quarter, required about the same amount of capital and aggregate in the banking system. And then the Basel system subsequently defended that as a temporary. I think even the Bank of England regarded that as a temporary measure, but it's been temporary for a long time. The Basel committee said, yes, you could do that as a temporary measure in a jurisdiction, but you had to do this this adjustment of the minimum upward. Now, the problem, some would point out, with adjusting the minimum upward and only excluding reserves is that that means that now the leverage ratio is friendlier to holding reserves, but still unfriendly to doing anything with those reserves, including lending in the repo market. So any event, it's, it's a complex regulatory issue that you're going to hear a lot more about in the next month or so. And just to be clear and make this sound very dire, if they don't do anything, then in March, there's going to be a sudden increase of a binding constraint on bank balance sheets, which could have a contractionary effect to the economy. Presumably, though, that won't happen. We'll have some changes before then. But if they don't, this is a real deal because, again, we have reserves north of $3 trillion and they're continuing to grow. So this will be a very consequential decision. And, and I don't hear a lot about it. I mean, You've brought it up. I've, I've seen maybe one financial reporter talk about it, but I don't think it's getting much discussion. Well, it gets a lot of discussion behind the scenes. I okay. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'm not running in the right circles there, Pat. I need to, right. <laughs> I need to run in your circles more. Okay. Yeah. One 
question I had on this section. So you suggested, you and Ellie suggested that in making this permanent change, you remove reserves from the denominator. Totally agree. makes a lot of sense. But leave treasuries. And I understand your, your reasoning. The reasoning is that they still are subject to interest rate risk. We were just talking about that earlier in the show. But let me, let me just play devil's advocate here. Your proposal is a package, right? So you're going to have a standing repo facility as well as making this change to the supplemental leverage ratio. So if you have a standing repo facility, is there really any interest rate risk to the treasury? Because you can always run to the standing repo facility, you know, convert it into cash if you had to at, at a fixed rate. I mean, would that minimize your concern or not? So you're saying with a standing repo facility, they could always hold the treasury security to maturity. But I'm not sure we want a system in which, again, historically, at least the way you would view an emergency liquidity facility, whether it's the discount window or the standing repo facility, this is supposed to be short-term usage to get you through a crisis. It's not a facility you would want to use and just keep rolling over those repos for, say, 30 years so that you could convince yourself there was no risk. So I don't think regulators or central banks are likely to look at it that way. One of the main reasons that you have a leverage ratio when people look at the risk-based approaches and, and see deficiencies in them, one of the deficiencies they see is that under the RWA approach, the risk weight attached to a government security is zero. And that's uh, actually true whether it's uh, the United States or whether it's uh, not to pick on those poor folks, but say Greece. So there's a real problem, I think, with, with excluding. I don't think you're ever going to get international agreement we're going to exclude government securities from the uh, leverage ratio. So your last reform, just to recap, we have standing repo facility, increased central clearing, and then tweaking the supplemental leverage ratio to exclude reserves from the denominator of it. Your last proposed reform is increased data collection. So what do you want to see done there? Two things. I think there's a question of what's collected by the regulators and then the question of what's publicly disseminated. Let's first tackle the, what's collected. That is one area where they've made some progress over the last few years. In particular, the self-regulator for the securities industry, FINRA, has begun collecting data on transactions in treasuries between FINRA members, basically between broker-dealers. And they, they have that data. And that data is what's being used in all these studies you're seeing emerging by Fed economists and office financial research economists on the treasury. I think where that has sort of fallen short is I don't think it includes repos. There is a separate data collection where they're getting lots of information about cleared repos from the fixed income clearing corporation. But I don't think even with respect to broker dealers, it's comprehensive. And then importantly, a bit of interagency politics, banks are not subject to the FINUT reporting requirement. And I think the Fed promised several years ago that they'd figure out some way to get bank transactions into the database. But that hasn't happened with great uh, alacrity, shall we say. So I think, and I don't think it covers repos, at least bilateral repos. So I think there's still some limits to, to the collection of, of transactions information on treasury transactions. Then there's the issue, and then I think also, then there's the issues of public disclosure. And I think those are, have, are twofold. I mean, maybe we'll go back. On collecting data, I think, too, whereas we collect data on broker-dealers, we collect data on banks, we don't collect data on other major participants in the treasury markets, whether those are hedge funds or principal trading firms or what have you. And it would be nice to know who are the big participants in, in the market, and I think probably more data should be collected on that. But the bigger problems, I think, are the luck of, lack of public transparency. The SEC, interestingly, uh, going back to speeches by Mary Jo White, you know, whatever that is, five, six years ago, emphasized the need that not only regulators collect data, but they make the data public. I would say both to inform public debate, like on questions like the ones we've been discussing, or simply to hold the regulators accountable for what's going on in those markets. But aside from the SEC, I don't think there's a great belief in the benefits of public transparency which is odd given that we have public transparency in most other markets. And we are talking about the treasury market, which you would think we would think is as important as any. It may 
again, reflect this view that treasury securities are risk-free going back, although this would forget about Salman Brothers, that they can't be, markets can't be manipulated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's past time to start making that data public. And the other thing I would say is I'm always astounded with banks or bank holding companies. You can go to the internet and find the, the regular, most of the regulatory reports, at least the quarterly major reports of every bank and bank holding company. The SEC publishes nothing whatsoever uh, on, and I've been complaining about this since at least the year 2000 when I was at the Fed, that they don't publish anything about the active the balance sheets of broker dealers. And I don't understand that. What's so different about broker dealers that people can know everything about what a bank's portfolio is and what its liability structure is and nothing about broker dealers. So I think that should change. So I think there's some more way to go in terms of transparency to regulators and then a long way to go in terms of, of public transparency of the treasury markets. So this could be done possibly through the Office of Financial Research as well as the SEC. Those would be the two agencies that would get that information out. Well, in terms of broker-dealer balance sheets, I, I, I don't know whether maybe the SEC has promised that they won't make it public. I don't know why they'd make such a promise, but they're the ones that could make it public, I think. Yeah. And in terms of the other data, again, it's being collected by FINRA. I'm pretty sure if the SEC and the Fed said that they thought that FINRA should make that data public, they'd make it public. So FINRA has it already. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Pat Parkinson. Pat, thank you so much for coming on the show to discuss your reforms for the Treasury market. All right. Enjoyed it. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.